Summer and I wanted to talk with you today about a, prog a program or a project that we're involved with called Our Stories, Brave Conversations on Race. And we figured we'd start by introducing ourselves and also give the people in the room an opportunity to introduce themselves because it's conversations on culture, we don't want it to just be one-sided. So <laughs> um, I'm Karen Reiner. I live here in Morristown. I've been here about 10 years. And uh, I live in kind of the historic section of town over on East Central Avenue. Um, my husband and I um, have uh, four children, um, ranging in age from 17 up to 26. And um, I got interested in this Our Stories program because I was so disturbed a couple summers ago after the George Floyd incident and wanted to find ways to help build some peace locally and hopefully have that emanate and build peace nationally. So that's how I got involved. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Tamara Johns, and I um, live in Moorestown also, and we live over in Stanwick Glen. We've been here for about 19 years, and we have two children, um, a daughter who's 25, and a son who's 18. And I got really excited when I heard about this program because I've always been interested in having conversations with people about race just to help build understanding, and I'm very comfortable with that. Um, but I also feel that it is so much more impactful um, to talk about our stories than it is to just kind of lecture people about facts, because I think that just telling stories is the best way to bring understanding. And my favorite, one of my favorite quotes is um, by Mr. Rogers, and is, and that is, there isn't anyone that you couldn't learn to love if you got to hear their stories. And so that's why I thought that this program would be really valuable for me. So what we'd like to do before we get kicked off is to just go around the room and have each person spend, you know, 10 to 15 seconds. It doesn't have to be your life story, <laughs> but your name and why you were interested in coming today. Do you mind going first? Sure. Um, Isabella actually am the development manager here at Cook and um, I'm fairly new to Morristown. I've only been here since last September, or September before last. Okay. <laughs> um, a little under a year and a half. And um, I I'm really interested to hear more about what makes Morristown uh, click, I guess. Um, and I think this is a really big part of that. So I'm excited to see the conversation with everyone today. Great, thanks. Sylvia, do you want to go next? So, yeah, I'm Sylvia Jacobs. Um, if you look through the trees, there you can probably see my house. <laughs> 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 I'm probably on the next house. Sarah Palin. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, I lived here for more than 40 years. Um, my husband and I raised two children here. They both now grown and no longer living in Morristown. No four grandchildren. And um, this is something that I, I mean, I, I, I think understanding where other people are seeing us and helping us them in a way other than just simply, you know, the obvious things that one sees about certain societies and certain are very important. And I think that, you know, getting to work is really important. And it, this is a program that I have sort of like said I really want to get involved with and have it. So I saw the email this morning and I thought, ah, huh, they can just walk over. <laughs> Great. Great. We're glad you did. Okay, um, Marlene, do you want to go next? Um, I live here part time. Um, it's very beautiful. I'm from the city. Um, my house and everything is off. And my main house that I've lived in for six years and there's a town on my own. I'm Jackie Ives. Silicon Valley for two years, and there was a ton of diversity there. 
And I felt in the short time that I was there, it really enriched my life. And I thought if there's something more that I can learn or contribute, it would be good to participate and enrich my life further and maybe share that information and help other people enrich their lives. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I work at summer camp and do lots of little things. Um, I'm interested in different like best practices and ways to have difficult conversations or just any kind of like conversations and relational things. Um, I always like to learn about because like my relationships with people are the most important things in my life. Um, and I'm also running the like a workshop. Great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Robert King. Robert, I grew up in Morristown and now live in Del Rand. And, you know, I'm friends with that camera. I wanted to come out and support camera and, and the organization and everything. And in addition to, I do struggle with having uh, conversations without always feeling like I don't want to have those conversations, I guess is the best way for me to describe it. That's about nervous yeah. a little better than I do and how I feel about certain things because I talk to her about it a lot. But I, I, I really do want to, to learn how to not necessarily battle book. Or um, I think one of the things that I've said to Tamara and I've always struggled with doing these things is that I just don't feel that I need Mm -hmm. And like, what I want to do is learn and not have that that line set and say, you know, something. We all have something to offer, and just yeah. a, a whole lot more open. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. Like, and I think that your the way you feel about it is pretty common among people of color. So yeah. Yeah, it must be exhausting to feel like you're trying to teach white people all the time. <laughs> You know, and why should that have to be your job? Yeah. Great. Kara? Oh, um, <laughs> for anybody who wasn't in the room, um, I'm Kara. I'm the executive director here. Um, I, I really um, am really grateful to More Unity and to Karen and Hannah for being a part of this um, and being a part of our programming and, and uh, partnering with us on so many things. And I think um, this conversation um, is really so timely and so important, and I think um, it's such an opportunity for individuals to, uh, to really start to have those conversations in a safe space where you can ask the questions you feel like you might not ask otherwise, or um, and, and also be open to hearing things. Um, and I think that's, um, you know, we're, we're just, part, speaking on behalf of Perkins, we're just so grateful to have this opportunity to host these kinds of programs um, to be a support to the community. And um, so I absolutely want to be a part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, <laughs> Mike. <laughs> So I'm looking into understanding the law. Thank you. And he's filming this for us so that the folks who have a difficulty breaking away at 2 p.m. on a Thursday could, could still see it and benefit from it. So thank you for doing that.
So just to give you an overview, Our Stories, Brave Conversations on Race is a program that was established by a, a lady and a gentleman in North Carolina who were friends and who were Rotary Club members. And uh, she's African American and he's a white guy. And he said, listen, I really want to find a way for us to get people together and build peace in the world. That was his goal. And they put this program together. And so the concept is, it's, a, it's an event that goes over a six week period and it brings together five white people and five people of color. They've been doing it over Zoom, uh, partly because of the pandemic, but also partly because it creates a really safe and convenient environment for people. And it's facilitated by two facilitators, one white person and one person of color. And they've been doing it in North Carolina and uh, I found out about it and invited a bunch of people I knew to take to take it with me and Tamara signed up to, to do it with me. Um, so that's how we got involved and uh, we participated in separate sessions last spring. Um, she was in one co cohort and I was in another. And the whole time I was in it, I thought, I really want to bring this to New Jersey. I really want to bring this to New Jersey. And then when it ended, I said to Tamara, what did you think? How did it go for you? And she said, I really want to bring this to New Jersey. <laughs> and so we, we, our friendship just got tighter and we decided to, to do that. So we, we are the first kind of, uh, I use the term franchise just loosely. It's, the, it's all volunteer organization, but we were the first kind of group chapter. to franchise it, chapter, yeah. start a new chapter in a new state. And, um, and we ran two sessions, one on Tuesday nights and one on Thursday nights for six weeks back in the fall. And, um, and now it's spreading to other states across the nation too. So it's, it's pretty exciting. And the, yeah. of the people who participated with us, two of them said that they wanted to become facilitators. So if it keeps sort of growing exponentially like that, we have the ability to really have quite a few people go through these cohorts yes. and then become graduates of the program. And many of them have expressed interest in having accountability partners which be somebody they met in the program who they continue to stay in contact with um, and to, to learn, continue to learn from each other and, and hold themselves to standards that they want to hold themselves to. So it's really exciting. Yeah. So, so in these sessions, we really tried to create a safe space um, where people would feel comfortable sharing uncomfortable conversations or uncomfortable experiences, painful experiences. And other people could ask questions about things that they didn't understand and feel safe doing that. And so on the whole, um, it was pretty amazing. It was a great experience for us because the black people were really um, excited because they felt like they were seen and heard. And we got back words like they felt encouraged and they felt hopeful. And then white people um, expressed that they felt connected because they were able to understand things that were um, very different from their own life experiences. And um, you know, the whole, the beauty of all of this is that people get to the point where they feel that they can now move forward and help bring them understanding to their own respective world and spaces. Um, so we actually have, oops, that's, that's us. That's who we are. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we were supposed to have showed you that slide. Yeah. <laughs> so this so is. At, so at the end of each session, um, we ask people to say one word that sums up how they're feeling in the moment at the end of the session. And we capture that for the six weeks. And then we plug it into this little tool called the word map and it created this image and the words that were used the most often show up the largest in the image. And so it gives, this gives you just a sense of the way that this touched people's souls, the way that it gave them strength and hope for the future, gratitude and, and empathy and connection. Um, one person actually said that she had felt, um, she had felt hydrated. <laughs> as though she was a shriveling plant and she had been watered. And um, these kinds of things um, just made me feel so fulfilled mm -hmm. and, um, and feel as though this work can be so meaningful. Yeah.
Great. So in order to help people or to make sure that people feel um, safe in discussing their stories, um, particularly ones that are painful to recount, we always start off the session with agreed upon set of guidelines for conversation. So today we also want to give you a taste of what a six-week program might be like. Sorry, Robin, you didn't realize you'd be participating. <laughs> <laughs> But this will also tie into Perkins' theme for conversations on culture. Um, so please keep um, these, dis these guidelines in mind um, when, we are, when we're talking today. Um, so just to kind of quickly go through them. So mindful speech, you know, of course, in these conversations, we tr really try to stay again, stay away from partisan issues like politics. Um, our goal is not to agree with each other, but to come to an understanding. Um, deep listening, so you're going to listen for the speaker's experience. Staying fully present and hold to the energy of I'm here for you. Um, everything that we say in this room is kept confidential. Of course, you may share the stories you hear, but please don't attribute them to a specific participant without their permission. And if you can keep your comments brief, um, just to allow maximum participation. And then, um, especially we're on Zoom and we've got 10 people, <laughs> we've had to try to redirect people, so accept the direction <laughs> from the facilitators, and no one is there to shame or blame anyone. And the first one, which is a very sort of simple one, is when you were growing up, did you have any friends of a different race? And we're not looking for yes, no answers here, um, <laughs> unless you didn't have any. But if you had friends of a different race, you know, what kinds of friends were you? Did you go to each other's houses? Did they have an influence on your life? Um, if you didn't have friends of a different race, was that in part because you grew up in a community that was very similar to you or, um, or not? So does, any, does anyone like to start with whether or not they had friends of a different race growing up? Marlene? I can't hear you. I'm sorry. My girlfriend was um, from 1948, and when the communists took over China, the family had to leave. They were very liberal. The father had been educated at Harvard. And um, they were a long family. He came all the way over from the U.N. I think represented probably um, Taiwan. I don't know. And she was Chinese. And we were in our flat the seventh grade. And we were going to high school. But I was the only one in my Anyone else? Yes. Uh, I'm half Korean, half Caucasian. So, I, and I grew up in Baltimore, which there are a lot of more heavily Korean uh, neighborhoods and, and communities outside of Baltimore and Baltimore County, but within Baltimore itself, where I grew up, was predominantly black and uh, white. So, all of my friends, <laughs> literally all of my friends, were of different races than I am, um, which I didn't really think that much of, um, and I was actually telling my mom this story the other day that had just come back to me, but one of my, my very best friends, um, and she was white, her family were very lovely, I used to hang out with them all the time, and I remember her mother said to me one day, you know, all of my children have had brown friends, every one of them have had a brown friend. And I was like, oh, okay. I, like, and I think I must have been 11 or 12 or something like that. So I just kind of was like, yeah, I'm the brown friend. Like, great. So I'm happy for Hannah. Um, and I didn't really think that much of it. But then you grow up and you kind of reevaluate what it was to grow up and what you were surrounded with. And it came back to me. It's like, that was kind of messed up. <laughs> was I being reduced? to that, I don't really know, and to me it was just, I was just friends with Hannah, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. I 
actually didn't have very many Asian friends or Korean friends until I went to college. Mm. And that was like a whole new experience of being with people that recognized part of my life experience and getting to share that with them in a very, in a much deeper way. Yeah. Mm. Great. Thank you. Who's next? Sylvia? So, um, I, I spent the first 14 years of my life in England. And um, I, my family and I, I was, we were Jewish, and the town we lived in had a very, 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 very small Jewish population. And so I was the person who was the different race, you know, and people. You know, I mean, that, that that was how I was identified. My parents were also German, so it was, you know, this was England, not that late after World War II. But I mean, it was, you know, I was somebody who people looked at, you know, and said, oh, she's different from the rest of us. Um, yeah. And interestingly, so then we came here and parents, both left Germany before, you know, before 1939, but, but they both had, you know, close relatives who died in the Holocaust. And I remember, the other thing I remember about my parents and what they said about us is that I always thought that my parents were fairly liberal. And my brother, one time, brought a friend of his to the house. She was black. And my father, who was a very, very mild man, Absolutely furious and said, Don't come in my house. That was, that was a real eye opener for me. Mm. Especially in terms of who we had been growing up. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I, um, I didn't, I guess for me, the first time I saw. Or I had friends of a different race was probably when I moved here to Morristown. Because for 10 years of my life, I lived in Philadelphia. And although I went to Catholic school and the priests and the nuns were white, I didn't see them as white. I just saw them as priests and nuns. And I was um, asked to go to this dance ballet school on, in Philadelphia. And if you know anything about Philadelphia, Walnut Street. Walnut Street is, you know, the Walnut Street was like the street um, back then, probably still now. And I remember my mom taking me because I had been at a black studio for a very, well, I had been at a black studio actually, not for a very long time, I was moved here at 10. And then when I went there, of course, I didn't know the word alienated, but um, I felt, I knew it was a difference. I knew it was different, and I told my mother, I never want to go back there again. Um, because, I, you know, the, the girls, the kids weren't treating me well. I was just in the corner. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. So, I, so my first, then moving here, was really my first time ever having white friends and, and friends of all different ages, but white in particular is when I moved here. Yeah. And did they make you feel welcomed? Oh, no. No? No, 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 no. And that was in 1969. And again, now when I say, oh, no, like that, again, I, I went to Catholic school. So my parents sort of think, oh, well. Oh, well, GC. And so it was my, um, it was my, it was myself and it was my brother. And I, my, and my, Maiden name is King, and that's where I really felt it the most. It was Black History Month, and um, and at that time I really thought I wasn't going to talk Black History Month because they were talking about Martin Luther King. Live here, but 
can we just go back and go to school back over in Philly? And it wasn't until I actually went to public school and they finally allowed me to go to public school, which was the year year after, because <laughs> we just rebelled. Like, this is this is just I hate it. I hate the people. And um, and they let us. Uh, my parents let us go to public school, and there is when more friendships were developed. Was in public school. What what was the time frame around that? Um, um, we moved here in nineteen sixty nine. So. Um, so 1971, I guess, is when I went to public school. Yeah. Right. Did you go to Marshall High School? Yes. That's why I asked. Yeah, okay. <laughs> my brothers and my sister, we all graduated from Marshall High School. Anybody else want to answer the question about whether you had childhood friends of a different race? Follow on your path there because having gone to Morristown High School, um, I didn't I didn't start school until 1975, I guess, you know, kindergarten, so, and my experience going to school here, um, I went to Baker School, which um, where it's located um, is a very significant. Yeah, yeah, so, and one of my good friends growing up, Jerome Perry, lived on Church Street, and it was, yeah, so I, I did have some friends um, growing up, and, and you know, some friends of a different race, um, but it was, I think it was really proportionate to how many students I was exposed to, so, mm -hmm. you know, I knew the children that were in my class, and they were friendly, and Robinson Brothers, you know, Jerome and, and, and so there were there were people that I knew and I, I was I was friends with, but um, it, it was definitely proportionate to the, the student population. Um, and for me, I, mean, I think I felt a little bit like Isabella did, only on the reverse, just kind of like, well, these are just my friends. You know, when, I think when you're little. <laughs> Um, these are just your friends, <laughs> you know, and you, you don't describe your friends necessarily as, there's not enough baggage there. Right, mm -hmm. right. I mean, yeah. you know, Joellen was my friend um, who has a really pretty mom. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, 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 so it, it was, um, it was, a, it was a different experience for me, I think, just because I, um, I don't think. Race was not really a topic. Like it wasn't something that we discussed or that we, you know, where my parents made it a point to say, you know, this is how you should act or this is how you should be. You know, it, I think experientially, it was it was very, um, it was just a very natural connection. So for me, it, it didn't it didn't feel like a conversation. Um, Right. Mm -hmm. okay. I grew up in a predominantly white community. Um, out of Jersey City, and we moved to Mommastown, and we did have black kids in our class, and we were friends, and there wasn't a lot of racial tension in the community that I grew up in. Um, I don't remember it being an issue. I will say, in my house, um, my father was a police officer. And um, he was on the city police uh, during the time of the North Riot happened. And so his, his um, sharing of the stories that he could recount um, were racist. <laughs> and um, I think that was my first experience when I was old enough to, you know, I didn't ever really put it in any other perspective other than being a child and using a Catholic school. You know, Basically, what did you learn from your parents about race? So, if anybody wants to answer either question, we'll open we'll open that up. Of course, again, <laughs> I had more time to think about it. I have a very good read ahead. But um, again, I was talking with my mother about this pretty recently. My my mother's from England and Caucasian.
education, and my father is from South Korea and had moved to the U.S. when he was quite young. So it was that time within the Korean immigration story where um, you're really encouraged to kind of lose a lot of your ties to the original Korean culture and language and to assimilate as much as you can. So the household I grew up in was very Americanized Korean immigrant and a white woman from the uh, UK. And um, you know, there weren't a lot of tools for them as a biracial couple having a kid in that time period to really have conversations with their kid about, you know, how does it how does it feel being biracial and what does that do for you? And how do you like how do you identify? I had to do a lot of that work myself. But then I also grew up in a place where I didn't really have other people to have that conversation with. I didn't have peers who looked like me. Um, a lot of times growing up, there was always somebody coming up to us at the mall or at the grocery store saying, where are you from? Um, <laughs> and I'm like, what kind of guess? Are you Mongolian? And like, oh my gosh. Consistently. And that has thankfully stopped as much as I've grown older. I think people have kind of realized maybe that's not an appropriate topic of conversation when you don't know the person at all. Um, and it was, again, when I reached college and I started meeting other people, and what that means, and then having these conversations with my mom where I'm kind of the person teaching her a little bit more. And she's apologized to me since, saying, like, I feel really bad that we weren't able to have these conversations with you when you were younger, and to support you in that. And I had to kind of take the load off of her and say, look, you, you loved me, you gave me a lot of things. You didn't have these tools. A lot of these conversations weren't public yet. They were happening amongst, you know, but it had not trickled down to the point where we were able to have discussions like this back in the early, back up in the 90s. Like, how were you supposed to do that? You couldn't. So we can do it now, and that's great. Yeah. looking at the question, and I think you, you know, how the question can speak for myself. Um, I guess I'm very challenged with that, because it's really making me think, like, did somebody talk about that? <laughs> and I don't, I don't really ever remember, now I'm, I'm only talking about, you know, when you're young. You know, I don't ever remember them talking about it when we were young. I don't remember, like, when we went home and we told our parents, what we were feeling at school or, you know, or any of the activities, you know, I don't remember them saying anything, you know, other than listening to us and then <laughs> us just praying, please, that the school year gets you back. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, like, they didn't say, well, why don't you, and this is the reason, and these people are terrible people. Like, they never said any of that. It was, so, it was only as we started getting older and we started forming our own opinions. And where then they would engage, because then obviously we're engaging with them. And, and, and between my, my son and my oldest brother and my younger sister, we wasn't really feeling the things that much with that middle brother. <laughs> that one, which is really ironic that he's not like that now, but that one. I mean, he always felt it. He always, but again, wasn't, we never sat down and, and talked about it. Like, like, well, Daryl, why are you feeling that way? What did they do? And it was only, and, and you know, and, and I often talk about, now I'm sorry if I'm taking up. Um, but I, I really, that, this is why I'm here. This is what I struggle with. Like, why am I feeling the way that I feel? Because it didn't come from my parents. Where it really came from, I think now is just, you know, like the TV shows, you know, or, <laughs> or, you know, if they're showing us, you know, if they're showing us, you know, the hose is being turned on, and it's, because that was not my reality. It wasn't necessarily my parents' reality, so they didn't say, 
this is what happened when you were walking down the street. <laughs> or anything. So I think that's where we formed it. I know that's where I formed, formed it. And then, you know, and then from there, when you started feeling different things, but your mind would go, would go back there and say, well, if that was happening, then this is happening, and now that's the reason why that's happening. <laughs> but it wasn't from my parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, that one didn't come up in this whole meeting. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, but it wasn't like had the same like official tone to it. And like I also definitely relate to what you said, where it's like once you started coming to them with your own ideas and observations about like the world, then they would have been Because so other than that, it was like occasionally my grandma who was from Kentucky would say something weird and you'd be like, Grandma, um, and then that was kind of it. Um, but like, I got a lot of it from like the internet, like understanding how to talk about stuff, and then going on Tumblr and like making friends and like having conversations like that way. Um, and then like going to like my parents and being like, I'm mad about this thing. And, you know, yeah, talk about it. But, yeah. 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 Anybody else messages that you got from your parents about race? Well, it was definitely an experience. My mom was a school teacher, um, <clears throat> and we had family and friends of several different races. Um, so I think the first time something came up um, about that, my mom and both of my parents really like had a talk with me. I think I remember being about five or six years old about color or even just about skin tone and differences like that I might be noticing that or but you know we have friends that you know look different and you know have different traditions. Um, I don't know if they always knew how to talk about that but I, I knew understood from a very early age that um, that we shouldn't discriminate. Um, and I remember my mom being really vocal about that. And I don't know if that was, you know, I think that was her in general. Um, I don't think that was even her upbringing. I think that was actually one of the ways she wanted to sort of break away from her family is something that she didn't agree with. And um, so she and my dad were fairly um, vocal about that. Uh, and I remember it coming up at, during certain times and it was just absolutely not accepted in the house. Um, if, if that ever, you know, kind of that came up, or my grandmother, I remember, um, had said something, and my mother like picked me up, and she was really big around it. Mm -hmm. So it was just very, um, that was what I learned. I don't know if we had all the language about privilege. I will say that understanding the privilege of a, as a white person, um, we didn't really discuss that. It was just that it's not right to discriminate.
Right. I think as an adult, I'm surprised when I think back about our family and friends um, that we didn't know if they were going through. Like, I don't know. I don't think anyone ever talked about it or brought it up. Um, you know, if they were dealing with any of that in their own family privately. You know, if they were feeling racism or, um, you know, we were just friends. They, they were just. You know, so we did, you know, we went camping trips or we, you know, did whatever friends, family friends do, but um, I don't really remember any discussions about the race specifically. So looking back on that as an adult, I'm sort of surprised it didn't come up at all, but. So um, the next question is, when was your first encounter um, with racism, either as a target or as an observer? Sylvia. So, um, I, um, I was in high school and college in the 60s. Um, and um, so, one of the first things I was aware of on a national level was, you know, all the racial acts that were happening. Then. And so, that was really my first encounter with racism as an observer. You know, the, the people who were rioting were predominantly black or that black. I mean, that was, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there was, there really wasn't anybody, certainly not my parents, um, and probably not even my college experience that was telling me to look at this in any different way. Mm. Um, so I, I mean, it was an education for me mm -hmm. to sort of learn that there's a way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. And that's certainly not the person who I am now. But that, but that was certainly my first encounter. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Is that anyone else? Um, Marlene? I may be talking to you about that. Okay. So I went home to the store. We were uh, renting the store. And I, I don't know any black people of color in our area at all. And I don't know what the color of the people in our campus look like. But someday, I, in the back of the day, I saw a house of school that was in there. And there were only black people in that house, just the clothes that I was talking about. And my house was in that And um, she was crying on the sidewalk. And I'm not thinking about her as being different. I don't even know where she stands at the school. But there's nothing I thought that was maybe an insult. I don't even know. Anyhow, she got past the school bus, crying on the sidewalk. And suddenly a woman across the street yelled to me that she was going on. She was on the sidewalk and she told the girl. Mm. And I remember being so shocked about this. Not as racism, as she's so weak. This woman is so weak. Mm -hmm. to and, this, and I remember thinking, she's an adult. She should have felt that way. So right. I was hurt by that. I didn't say to her, it's a white adult. She was just an adult. Right. Right. And um, she never came back to the house. I don't even know where she lived. Certainly we're not in the blocks where I live. And I remember telling my mother about it. My mother was pregnant. She had come to the country in the service of that London. And I, I said to her, I want to stop her. I want to stop her. She told me, and I remember my mother saying, well, I'll talk to her. But I don't think she ever did. Mm -hmm. But that has stayed with me mostly because I'm trying to figure out, well, in the neighborhood, 
<laughs> right. little girl, if she was in the room today, I wonder how clearly she would still remember that incident. What would it for her, the first incident? I thought about it. I didn't think of anyone. Uh -huh. I don't know any of her anymore. Just the whole, the whole thing with me was about an adult talking to a child and just agreeing on it. So, when I think about that and I think of my mom and stories that she told me I would ask her what was it like back then and she grew up in the south some of those things that you may observe may have looked like just normal everyday experience and expectation for a child like that yeah wouldn't have been wouldn't have been an unusual experience. It wouldn't have, it would have almost have been expected to, that you would be treated that way. The question is interesting because a lot of people may not have given thought to this before. Um, what is it like to be a white person in America? So for those of you who identify as white, that's common. Sylvia. I think, I think it depends on the, you know, the time period. And certainly if you're talking about what it's like to be a black a white person in America now, I mean you feel well, I guess kind of on your economic status as well because everything is better. And guilty. And guilty, you said? Guilty. Because we have this privilege. And, you know, it's not for us. Do you, when you say versus growing up, is that because you've been made aware of it in more recent times? Yes. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? I'm so sorry. What's your name again? Um, I guess it's kind of hard to sum up in one sentence, but it feels like there are a lot of different things, but at this point it feels like a responsibility um, to not be the way that everything sets you up to be. Everything sets it up to a certain degree. You feel entitled. You feel safe everywhere. You feel like you can stick your hand in any pot and you deserve it. Mm -hmm. um, Got it. Anyone else? Yeah, I think at, on that point, it feels baked in um, to a point that it's almost um, everywhere you look. It's um, that advertising, media, uh, specifically caters to whiteness. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, I mean, it's at, in so much. 
watch it uh, inform this entire culture. So it can sometimes be insurmountable to, to break that down. Mm -hmm. things that we do in the, the six-week session, which we have not done here, is we've got some, some terms, um, and one that we don't even introduce until the, third, fourth, the, third, the yeah, fourth. third or fourth session is the term about white privilege, which you guys have brought up today. Um, so just in general, like one thing to understand is that Privilege doesn't mean that you had it easy. It just means that the color of your skin wasn't part of your struggle to get there. I, I almost wish there was a different word for it because I know a lot of people do get hung up on the word privilege. Um, and one of the things I learned about it was it includes such things as if you open up a magazine, are you likely to see people who look like you? And when you're looking at leaders, you know, the president and the Senate and the principal, are they likely to look like you? And if they are, then you have the privilege of fitting into society as what's considered the norm. You know, one of the things we talked about when Tamara and I were doing this is somebody had written a book about this that I would consider myself an American and that Tamara would consider herself an African-American, right? Or I'm a woman in Morristown and Tamara is my black friend, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, um, but she, but I, she doesn't have to refer to me as her white friend <laughs> because it's the default in society. The white mm -hmm. is the default, I guess. And yeah. so there's a privilege that comes to that that's not necessarily an economic privilege. Mm -hmm. um, Although sometimes it can also be an economic privilege because white people make more money than black people on average and mm -hmm. maybe get promoted faster on average, et cetera. But, right. but I know the term privilege, for, especially for anyone who, is who grew up in a family who struggled economically, they think, well, I didn't have a silver spoon, I, so this term doesn't apply. Yeah, when it, it really doesn't relate to that at all. It's about what's considered normal or like Karen said, default. But even for people who struggle, um, I guess you'd have to consider what the struggle would be like if in addition to maybe not having advantages, whether it's education or economics or zip code, if they were also black. And what would that look like, the difference between someone who's white in that situation versus someone who's black in that situation? And that's what it has to do with more so than the fact that a person had to struggle. Anyone else? No. Sylvia? I've been thinking about that too. You know, when you first said something about privilege, um, I thought about yeah, because 
I mean, I know when you're growing up, being single really, for my parents, was very um, challenging economically. We came to this country thinking, you know, we had we had really nothing. Um, and you know, they said it then, you know, you go for the fact that you that you need tuition in, in certain situations made us different. But I think, but then I'm thinking about what you just said. So, so the question that I was just faced with on this, okay, we've been starting tenth grade, so two years of being just, you know, just sort of really living in a fairly wealthy community in North Jersey and being sort of people think you can have a nice living environment and so forth. And I had a way to college. And I spent, I spent the summer between graduating from high school and college remaking myself and going into New York City and buying, you know, looking at like um, magazines and Find myself clothes that I thought would I would look different, and I remember going to a dermatologist, and I had acne, and you know that he was just skin. So I had the ability when I went to college to be a different person than who I was when I was in high school. So which I guess is backing up what you're saying. Yeah, and also I mean even if you look at people of color who are educated and they seemingly have done well um, they might be your neighbor they still had a struggle that was different than if they were had the same background but were white um, they still had struggles that they could identify or situations that they could identify that made their climb different than their counterparts who were white and that's what privilege or the lack thereof is you know, what's it like to be a black person or a person of color in America? There's a lot of stress that comes along with that then. Oh, absolutely. Um, one mm -hmm. of the women who was in one of the sessions that we ran in, in the fall talked about how when she's in um, Wegmans or Home Depot and she feels a sneeze coming on and she needs to grab a tissue from her purse, she intention she's a black woman, she intentionally walks to the very center of the aisle under a light so when she reaches into her purse, no one accuses her of shoplifting. And I thought, gosh, when I feel a sneeze coming on, I just sneeze. You know? <laughs> I don't have to think that if I reach into my purse, there's some distrust that's going to happen. And millions of incremental things like that put a stress on her back that I don't have on my back. So that's, 
like that's a privilege I have, regardless of what's in my bank account, you know? So that, that sort of thing to me is just, it's like a weighted blanket that gets heavier and heavier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would say that, um, just to tie into what both of you said, that it doesn't matter what your socioeconomic level is, it doesn't matter where you live, what your background is, what you do, it's literally that stranger's perception of you based on the color of your skin. So that's what makes it. For me also in my family, I mean, I'm the first person who had been born in the U.S. And um, having grown up with family members who, their, their English was okay, they could get by, but really they're, they're still Korean. It adds a whole new element of judgment to think about. Um, and my, my mother told me a story recently that I hadn't known about my great grandmother who, I mean, this is a woman who propped the entire family off her back. Hmm. She's the only, the, she's the reason that they were able to get from North Korea to South Korea during the Korean War. Wow. And then come to the U.S. and she, I mean, my, my family was were architects and like philosophy teachers in mm. Korea, and they came to the U.S. and they sold wigs and were still interested. Mm. So it's that immediate just bounce right back to the bottom. Right. And then they got the American dream, all of that. She was in pain one day, and my father took her to um, health care. And she was trying to explain in Korean through my father what the problem was and all of that. And she's kind of moaning, she's in pain, and she's in her 80s. And um, the doctor leaves the room, he's a white man. And my father, she tells something to my father, and he needs to go tell the doctor. So he goes out to find the doctor, entertaining all of the staff of the health care by making fun of my great grandmother moaning in pain and making fun of how she was speaking. Mm. Mm. It's just another layer that you have to fight through. Yes. And I'm completely divorced from it because I don't speak that language. Right. So it's just. Right. Yes. The last question um, What creates prejudice and what can an individual do to overcome it? Hmm. Fear that somebody else will have something that you can't have, or um, I think it's fear of the unknown or difference in fear of the other, and then fear of not understanding. Mm hmm. <laughs> Those are good. I guess um, everything that you have done, and in terms of what can an individual do to overcome it, it's just seeing that person as a person. You know, that, I mean, that's the, I mean, we all are, you know, when we're talking about, you know, privilege and looks like to us and, and socioeconomically. If we just see people as people and not, you know, if they're going to take some, take up my job or do this or do that, I mean, if we're all struggling, we're all trying, the end game is to be, to be able to provide for your families and, and similar to what you're saying, to be able for your grandmother to go to the hospital and be heard. I mean, you, if we went to school to be a doctor, See the person as your patient. Mm-hmm. I mean, so we just have to see each other. I, I think that's the only way that we're going to overcome prejudice. It's just being, I mean, having deep discussions, but really understanding that we're all, this is something that we all see. This is something that, that has been in our past, 
and we really try to work at it, but if the people that are supposed to be without bringing politics in are our leaders or what our children are watching or what our children can and cannot read, if we, if we just go, if, the, if we can't do any of that and you don't know how to separate that, then just be kind. <laughs> we all are here to try to take care of our families and take care of ourselves and, and having the best outcomes for our grandmother and having the best life for them. It's, I mean, it's just that simplistic to me. So. Yeah, and, and I think that um, there are a lot of things that can be done um, through organizations like this, for example, but it's really about understanding the issue first. And then, like Mike said, he's working on things that you can do about it, but there are things that we can do as individuals. And that's what this uh, organization seeks to accomplish and to help people see for themselves. These are, um, these are just a few testimonials of people who participated in the Our Stories program before. I don't know how easy you can read that. Yeah, maybe I'll read it. <laughs> Why don't you read a few? Okay, well? so um, the first one is, I truly believe in the power of stories as a tool for connection. Many of us tend to work, live, and rec rec recreate in the same circles. Our stories allowed me to share my experiences with folks I might never meet. It is a gift that will keep on giving. Um, Tony Jones, who's a black gentleman, says, I think it provides a closer understanding of what it means to be white and, be, and to be black. In addition, it gives everyone the opportunity to open up about race problems. Uh, let's see, Sarah says, something I loved about our group was how diverse it was, both in race, age, gender, and education. I could tell it was incredibly thoughtful in how the group was put together and it provided so much value. I think it's incredible that our stories gives people a way to connect with others that they likely wouldn't have wouldn't have at first. You know, we're hoping that having given you this little sample of what this is like, that perhaps you yourselves would be interested in participating in an upcoming session. We're planning the next ones to happen the week of start the week of February twenty first. Um, and we can we intend to continue doing these as long as we have people who want to do them. So if February doesn't work for you, we'll probably be doing it again in May <laughs> or June. Um, uh, so we ask that you consider joining yourselves. Um, and to sign up, you just go to ourstoriesonrace.org. We have a flyer we can hand out. Um, and you can apply. It's not an application to college. <laughs> you may, you may <laughs> if you apply... And, and if we accept right you, the week, you don't get in. Um, so we do have a very strict rule, though, that the session should be pretty much 50-50 white people and people of color. Um, we had 19 people go through in the fall, so we did have one session that was five and four. So it doesn't have to be exactly even, but uh, we don't want uh, any group to feel uncomfortable or overwhelmed or, or dominated. Um, we also ask that you help spread the word to other friends that you know who might be interested. Um, we, not surprisingly, because we have more white people in our culture than people of color, we have more wh white people signed up who want to do this than people of color. So we, in particular, need more people of yes. color. And if you look around the room, we, in general, in particular, need more men. Um, but we'll run, rest we'll run sessions with all women. It doesn't matter to us, but it's really helpful to have a representation of the culture as a whole. And also because men also have spheres of influence. So the, the goal of this is to help them to be impactful in their spaces. Yeah, great point. Great point. Um, we'd also like to ask you to brainstorm about either people or organizations you belong to that might appreciate a similar uh, you know, taste test like we had today. Mm -hmm. So if you have a house of worship or if you belong to the Rotary Club or the Lions Club or a book discussion group or anything like that, if you would like Tamara and me to come and do a similar program, we would be thrilled. Um, we're also open to feedback. This is the first um, kind of, you know, 
road show that we've done uh, <laughs> other than actually doing a session. So if you have any feedback, we'll, you know, we'll t happily take it. And if you have any questions about it, our email addresses are on there. They're also on the flyer. And I'll, I'll put the flyer right here on the table. Um, it has everything you need if you want the website to sign up and if you want to be able to contact us. And really, I, I, I'm very grateful for all of you sharing your stories. Yes. And I hope no one felt too put on the spot yeah. <laughs> with it. Um, so thank you for coming and yes. thank you for. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>